So I'm going to take a look at a, a little bit of everything today, and I'm going to start with this fella. Um, biggest issues. Uh, the, the light source is inconsistent, as usual, throughout the canvas. This is a big problem that you guys have. And for those who neglect doing form studies, meaning you don't train your brain to <clears throat> think like everything is in one room. So that's one of the lessons that you learn out of doing form studies or doing like extensive form studies where they turn into landscapes or blob people, um, which are wonderful ways to advance your form study. It's not always about drawing cubes, by the way, guys. There are, there are levels uh, in, in, in the form studies. Uh, there are advanced form studies, which are really populated form studies, basically like a polygon version of the world, um, where you've got a table, you've got a character on a table, but everything is a form study, thinking only about planes facing light source. The, cu the cubes and the, s and the blobs and the squares and the circles and the cylinders are all very, very elementary shapes, which you should all start with. That's step one. Uh, but form studies altogether are a way to train yourself to think like everything is in one room, um, meaning everything shares the same light source. Or there are multiple light sources, and there's a primary, and then there's bounce light, and just the constant mapping of light source, but in one room. So when we have shadows receding on one side of the forehead, but a shadow pointing down from the nose, that's impossible. The forehead is like a, you know, like a horizon. It's really just a very flat surface. And when it, when so much shadow happens on such a large surface, it's like saying, um, it's just like having half of the earth in shadow. And then for some reason, uh, Kathmandu is, <laughs> is illuminated for has daylight. That's that's the only explanation for how this can have some daylight. This is the dark half of the face, and the largeness of the forehead is a giveaway for where the light source is coming from. So the light source is coming from this direction here, but you have the shadow of the nose pointing down. Um, if you're gonna, if your excuse is that there is secondary light source, no, there isn't. No secondary light source is strong enough to diffuse a core shadow. Um, light source value or a core shadow, core shadow, uh, like a cast shadow caused by, caused by a core shadow. I mean, a primary light source. Um, sorry, I've done too many classes today. Uh, so when we look at this and we see this totally illuminated, this is wrong. Big no-no. We see this area illuminated, big no-no. This thing is catching a lot of light. This half of the nostril, this, this nostril is in a lot of light. So this means that all the shadows should be traveling down this way. And look at that. Look at what a beautiful cast shadow that is. It's got a massive nose, this fella. So it's nice to cast a shadow once in a while. So let's start casting some shadows. Okay. So we are going to cast a shadow first and foremost off this nose. Don't worry, it's not going to stay this dark. It's just a slight little cast shadow. And then I'm raising this. So write it back to me. What does a form study also teach you? What is one benefit of the many, the multitude of benefits that a form study provides? What is one, one really big one that I just mentioned? Okay, so the eyeball is a little bit has its own contour, so it gets more of a spherical cast shadow. Same with the, and then this cast shadow follows the swell of the cheek. <clears throat> and this, this whole time since probably I started, uh, since I came back, I haven't been wearing my glasses to teach. Um, I'd have to wear the cast with it, and the cast is just hell. Uh, so, like this whole time I've been teaching without glasses, and it just sucks so much. Congratulations on 75k, by the way. Really? I hit 75? I haven't I hadn't noticed at all. I haven't been following my, my subscriber count. Call me when I'm when I'm 100. <laughs> Call me when I'm when I'm 99, and then I'll make a big deal out of it with you guys and host a party or something. So what we're doing here is we are changing the gradient of the background before I start casting everything in shadow. So the background should not be this dark. This is a large light source. Uh, the biggest giveaway for a light source that is universal is not all the cast shadows are long and shadow like shadowy, um, meaning they're not dark and they're not sharp. And this means that the light source behind him should be a little bit lighter. Um, and then if there is shadow, which remember that gradient we talked about last class, how you don't really see gradients until you're zoomed out in the entire wall or the sky. If you zoom in, you don't see much of a gradient because you're too close up. You don't notice the gradient as much. But you can go ahead and throw a cast shadow here. I'm going to leave it alone. 
and then I'm going to select the inverse. Treats, uh, tr t it, yes, exactly, Nika. Treat the objects like they're in one room. Exactly. Not direction of cash shadow. Well, yeah, that's, of course, the form studies do teach you that, but what I mentioned earlier is the important fact. All right, so what I'm going to do next is I'm going to start correcting all of this inconsistency here. So I'm going to get dark in. I'm going to cast this shadow, merge that down. And I'm going to start darkening this far half. Being, being very, very careful. Why am I casting such a big shadow? I, I really do want you guys to get involved in the discussion. What did this shadow represent? And I just discussed it. It has to do with form study. What is this shadow of the biggest signature of? What is it, what is it giving away? <clears throat> really, really basic question here. It's giving away something. I'm radially, radially uh, descending this cast shadow into the forehead radially descending that cheek into a cast shadow over here being very careful on control I'm like going backward with the control Z on purpose just to make sure I'm maximizing um, the form as much as possible it's the other side of the cube uh, the terminator no the terminator is like the well the terminator is the main main cast shadow of the course of, of the light source of the primary light source the terminator really is what we use when we're talking about bounce light coming in and to, deleting it and leaving behind that line. Um, but what I mean is very specific term, this very specific thing. The angle of the light, uh, his face is curving to the left, points away from the light. What do you mean points away from the light? It's a very specific term that I teach you guys and I say it a lot. And it has to do with form studies and anatomy. <coughs> Environment, no place of the light source? No, obviously, yeah, we've discussed the light source direction already. The form, yeah, and so we're going back to the most basic, basic core uh, shadows, the core shadows cast by the most basic geometric anatomy. So we're not seeing a face anymore. We're just seeing the blob. We're seeing faceless blobs in our brain to help us decide where all these cast shadows are pointing to. So this neck, this bounce light on the neck, way too strong. It's contesting the core shadow. Right here, his bust area. I'm going to cast that in a cast shadow. Everything gets a cast shadow on that far side because everything is wrapped around the core, the core shape, the geometric anatomy. All right? And that is how you know how the shadows wrap. That's how you determine how this light source and its direction is casting shadows on the object, whether or not they are depressions or how and when to use the radial shading. So you see I'm using radial shading because I'm thinking blobs. I'm not worrying so much about edge work right now because I'm thinking only in the most elementary shape. And already, already he looks 3D. That's the point of using form studies. In, in your mind's eye. It makes him look 3D. So let's take a look. It's like it's just like a different world entirely for this portrait. Before you had flat values and I'm gonna just go back to actually you know what? I'm gonna make his background the same as uh, this one so you can see. So it's not the background doing the work all that. It's the core shadow so I can prove the case. <clears throat> and then put that in. And merge that down actually like that. So do you see that? How much more three-dimensional he looks? And the reason why you didn't yours didn't look three-dimensional, no, the answer was geometric anatomy. Meaning we go down and boil it down to the most basic shape to help us remember to use the shadows where they belong. The core shadow. Alright, so what you did was I don't know if it's bounce light, I don't know what it is but you overuse that light on the far side. Considering that you were casting the shadow off the nose down, I don't think you even intended that as bounce light because you had all kinds of stuff going on in there. So you acted like there was another primary in the room on the far side. The reason why we don't want to defuse the, or use two primaries, never use two primaries. The reason why we don't want to avoid that, why we want to avoid that is because we will mess up the, the indicator of the three-dimensional shape. The indicator is the core shadow, wherever it manifests, we're, we're interrupting it. So now what I'm going to do is go one last time into those radial shades, that rotation. I'm not even thinking about bounce light right now. That's why we call it secondary. We'll think, we'll think about it later. We don't need that much mapping for a secondary light source. 
Why? Because the secondary light source isn't supposed to carry all the realism. You're not supposed to, um, you know, make it responsible for everything. It's just the secondary light source. It's just a tiny little baby. It's not the parent light of the entire painting. Right. And so now what I'm going to do is start fixing wherever we have excess shadows over here. So per shadow area, per section, we have regions of, um, like we have limits per area. So here we have shadows that have gone way down. The region, this entire region, this entire half of the blob is facing the light source. So it's not supposed to have values that drop that low if the areas that look away from the light source haven't even dropped that low. Do you understand? Because there's all kinds of bounce light happening over here. All right, so I'm going to defuse that. Also, I'm going to cast this nose shadow away from the light source. I'm using my soft brush because this is a polished painting and I don't want to interrupt it with some blocky brush, uh, which is meant for early painting stuff. Um, and then I'm going to throw in that shadow for the Cupid's bow and then defuse the shadow. It's not that strong. He's pretty pale. And then I'm just going to continue casting that nose shadow all the way around to wrap around the face. It starts a little bit lower. So this nostril, let's zoom in, this nostril is more close and more exposed to the light source than the septum. So this gets a little bit of a drop. It's still light, it's still part of the light half. You see this excessive shadow right here? This will be diffused with a bounce light eventually. I will be diffusing this with a bounce light. Another thing that you students do, which is super annoying, and I wanna, I wanna, I wanna, I wanna spank you all for it. Um, is uh, outlining under underneath the eyebrows. I don't know why you guys do it. I, I think I do. I think you guys from painting front view for so long end up. Uh, uh, I don't know. Just thinking that the the eyebrow is its own region. It's its own country, and no one can mess with it. <clears throat> so we need to stop thinking like that. We need to stop thinking like the eyebrow sits before the bone structure and no matter what core shadows are caused by the bone structure the eyebrow is immune. That's not possible. So this whole brow structure is hiding away these little white pieces underneath. That shadow is extending all the way. How about this side? So if you were saying oh it was the makeup and, and, and whatever and that's why I had a little bit of light. I mean you can get away with it here. Let's, let's not even touch this one. It could have just been the bo bone uh, I mean the fat of the eyebrow moving down and the makeup just getting compressed. Maybe you'll get away with it with this brow, but how about this one? There is no excuse at all, unless he's wearing eyeshadow. In this case, we don't really want to lean on makeup. Makeup is a bad excuse. Maybe he's sick. Maybe remember our villain uh, challenge when we discussed how to make something look villainous. We extend the shadows under the eye. We uh, completely flip the beauty try uh, the beauty uh, ratios and. We end up with something that's a little bit more scary and less easy to look at, something more sickly. Sickly is offensive to the viewer and makes a villain, which you've got it. You've got it all here. You know the messed up teeth, the crazy eyebrows, the whites of the eyes, <clears throat> all visible. All right, so I'm just gonna do a couple more final little shadows here. So I'm thinking about individual blobs, and then I'll bring in a bounce light. Over here, this whole section is looking at the light as compared. See, the neck extends all the way down. All right. And then we're thinking about the actual, like the whole cylinder of the neck. So the whole cylinder of the neck isn't being exposed to the light. There's a shadow here. Do you see the shadow you used on the hair? You didn't extend it into the neck. This is the biggest giveaway that you need two doses of form studies a day for two weeks um, uh, un until your, your prescription is done, until completed. You need form studies as soon as possible. All right, this should have been a, the biggest giveaway for you. Hey, this neck needs a core shadow all the way down because the light source isn't completely from the side, it's from front side, just like that. So you're missing on a chance to really show off a cylinder over here. And then you've got some leftover shadows. The core shadow of the neck should also be revealing the, the direction of the light source. And it should also travel down like this. <clears throat> so it's always, I've always been, whenever I talk about the cube, all the way back then when I had my cube epiphany and I started teaching, I've been talking about form studies. It's always been about form studies. 
because form studies erase from our brain those contagious and uh, aggressive symbols that refuse to shake off because our whole language system is based off symbols and words have symbols with them. Our brain is a very two-dimensional thing inside. It's just flattened. Our brain does not project in 3D. Um, I'm, I'm be very afraid of the being that we meet, meet that, that thinks in three dimensions. Um, but we, we have very flat pictures in our brain. Uh, we don't really need to have that extra RAM use on our brain to project 3D images. Our eyes just see all that stuff. So in our brain, our memory, it's all flat. And when we remember a tree, we remember just the silhouette of the tree, just what it looked like last we saw it. Or a picture of a tree that made it very easy to remember a tree, with stuff that we saw when we were kids in kindergarten and children's books. <clears throat> so the reason why I'm always talking about form studies, I will always mention form studies, is because they are the route to interrupting that symbol, that obsess obsess obsession with symbols in our brains and help us figure out, you know, wrap our heads around a drawing. The world has 3D work things in it. We want to draw things from the world, but our brain is two-dimensional. Our brain thinks in two dimensions. I'm, I'm not entirely sure about all this. There are people who are specialists who study how people think, but I'm sure there is a truth behind us thinking completely flat symbols and attaching them to, to pictures and, I mean, to words and all that. Next up would be the teeth. The teeth also need to be rotated away. They can still have those light pieces on them, but not the whole way and then this bounce light here on the side. I will bring in some bounce light, but it's not going to come before addressing the, uh, the primary. So primary is called primary because it is the primary and it's the king of your painting. It's the first. So you work on that first and then you worry about secondary light source. If you're a photographer and you're planning out a photograph and you, you, know, you don't cast the secondary bounce light first, you figure out which is the first paint, which is the first light source in your photograph, what you're doing with it, which direction it's coming from, and then you dress it up with minor secondary little light sources. So now what I'm doing again is I'm just building a more three-dimensional response to the light source, a more three-dimensional object all around. I think I went too dark here on the neck. that some bounce light from the wall behind him or something similar to that just something to defuse <clears throat> and now I can start bouncing some light bounce light can happen in all kinds of ways it can bounce off a nearby wall it can be a light source but is smaller and has less range than the primary which is universal it can be the Sun or an open window or a floodlight um, even that is considered secondary in, in, in daytime in nighttime that's considered primary but now we can do whatever we like. We can bring in these crazy, crazy light sources and uh, just cast them everywhere. So I'm going to start with the nose. You see how I'm not worrying about painting inside the edges? Because I can just get a new layer, of course, and then erase away and reveal what I want to reveal about the nose. But none of this is going to cancel out any core shadow. The core shadow is still going to be intact because what we're doing is revealing the trail of the core shadow. And that's that terminator line right here. And because the nose sticks out all the way, sometimes I even go to the level of expressing the light source, the secondary light source, to be this bright. Of course, this feels like a rim light. It feel, I'm not a rim light. It feels like an outline. Uh, so you're going to have to decide where the secondary light source is coming from. So I'm going to darken the top half of this bounce light, leaving it only for the bottom. And then because the lip is casting a shadow on it, it's in the way of most of the bounce light, so it's just going to be a little, little touch right there. And then again, on the lower part of the jaw and the chin, and I'm just casting. So in a second, I was going to take the mic, actually, after before class is done, and show you guys Portrait Studio. Portrait Studio is supposed to be answering all these questions um, about bounce light and... and and primary light source. It makes it very easy to plan what you're going to do with these or reference them. And I really would have died, just died for being able to show you exactly what I mean by primary as having diffused light sources. Universal has, has diffused, uh, sorry, shadows. And secondary has sharper shadows, longer shadows. I really would have loved to show you that, but I have to wait patiently for the update. Can't keep using the old version on screen. 
So I'm just bouncing that secondary defuse over here and it travels all the way up into the most most of these and just just the lower piece of every little every little section just the lower facing part of every little sub form study that sits on this massive uh, landscape that is the face oh <clears throat> have I disconnected am I still alive uh, we're not receiving data from your encoder <clears throat> Um, so I'm just going to wait this out. Uh, could be this rain or something. I'm not sure what it is. It's a bit windy here today, so. All right. Hopefully, uh, I'm not sure what it is. It could just be the YouTube servers. They did a massive update today on the layout, so could have just been that. So again, I'm looking for the, the bottom facing pieces of every little form study here. So the bottom facing piece here, anything that looks down towards the secondary light source that I imagine as a little orb just sitting there. And sometimes it helps to just draw the little tiny orb just to give yourself an idea of the direction again, or you can just draw out the, the diagram of the, of the orb yourself. All right, and this is how we do this. This is how we do secondary light source. We do the primary first, and then we lay off, I mean, we, we throw that secondary light source off the form of contours, longitude and latitude lines, the forms of the surface of the, of the object, and that comes with an understanding of form studies and studying forms. If you study the fact that something was a cube a long time ago before it became an advanced object, um, then you remember that there is a downward facing part of that object, the part that looks down. So I'm going to make this all the way bright. It's still going to look okay because it's sitting on the right area. It's all sourced out of the same object. And we don't have to worry about it casting new shadows because all it's, it can't cast the shadow on something that's already flooded. So you understand what I'm doing here? So yeah, it's a little messy application-wise, but this is exactly what we should be doing with our bounce lights. We do them after. And our bounce light, our secondary, isn't that strong, or the ambience bounce light isn't strong enough to completely um, undo the primary light source's regions, the light regions. So just because we have a shadow here, does not a light source here does not mean we have a second shadow uh, over here. The second shadow, if you guys see a painting with two shadows, or a portrait a photograph with two shadows, it means those light source light sources are both primary. They're both of equal strength. So a portrait with two shadows overlapping uh, are light sources of equal strength. Write that back to me. So two shadows happening in a, in a reference. Yeah. So I'm just going to clean this up. And this is if you want to be this dramatic. I mean, I recommend it. It's good for the... It's good for the painting to be a little bit more dramatic as if you're trying to go for something horrific. Light coming from the bottom, you have that flashlight thing going on, um, that freaky flashlight, um, but you don't have uh, a, a face that is unrecognizable. We still need a light source coming from above, revealing the most of the character. So the light source top down helps us reveal the character. Light sources that come from a lower angle um, hide a lot about the character's face and we can't d do as much uh, characterization because the cast shadows are distorting the image if, if, if the primary is coming from the bottom. All right, so just lots of rules and it's always cause and effect, conditions and all this, all this, you know, detail, but none of it stands without the fundamentals. None of it stands without the basics. Learning how to shade a good, you know, sphere in a gray background, choosing the right light source color, choosing the right uh, background color or value. Sorry, I'm really messing up my words lately. So all this is still very messy. There are areas that need more smudging than other areas. So this cheek is more spherical and dome-like. So it needs more of a 
of a bounce light. It's not complete rim light. Rim light happens on like a subsurface scattering that's captured from an angle. This actually is casting a shadow on the lips, just like that. Um, and then we have dark spots. So when we look at dark spots, let me erase this light source. When we have dark spots, um, they're still the most important in the painting. They're still the darkest points. They still are, um, just because we have a strong bounce light here doesn't mean that that bounce light together with the um, primary have canceled out the black. We still need lots and lots of black because we kept the primary intact. And that means we still have the most immediate responses to the primary, which are the dark spots, contrast wise still very very dark so we just get our black black and we go in and we need that all these areas intact because they are focal points and we're trying to bring all the attention back to the character so his hair is very very white so if you wanted something that is green green is dark um, if this is supposed to be the joker this is a complete cavity his teeth so you go for black, okay, and then his ears, ear holes are visible, also a dark spot. I just don't mention them because they don't face forward. All right, we still need to capture and establish all these, all these regions. The uh, cavity of the nose should be a little bit more radial because it slowly ascends into the, into the cavity of the nose. Do you think the Joker, Joker's boogers are purple? What color are the Joker's boogers? <laughs> and why do I need to know? Cylinder of the lip gets more light on it. Just like that. This has way too much white. This lip is just shining like you had lip gloss. And then I'm going to get my blocking brush and just start blocking in some of these edges. So under the lip in this little soul patch area. There should be a more uh, defined edge. Oopsie. And I am still, like this is back, right? I'm, I'm gonna get rid of that. So I, I don't want you to overdress your paintings with this. And I still, that light under the eyebrow now has a light source. So remember, see before you had it, you had it without a light source really to, to explain it. it. Didn't happen on the nose. There was no real bounce light happening on the on the uh, like on the lips or on the low any any lower half of the face and then we bring that in and now we explain where all that light underneath the eyebrow is coming from but I, I still would fix this one because it's just not, the primary is way more important the, the it's very tempting isn't it the um, the secondary it's very tempting it's so much fun look at it it's brought the, the painting to life but not without this descent into that dark right here that's happening here and you don't need necessarily for drama yeah you do need it but you don't always need this kind of balanced light and sometimes you just have to do the mature thing and continue casting shadows all the way down select inverse so continue that but grabbing some of that black and just very gently throwing off the face into like the full rotation just addressing the fact that there are areas that are completely unexposed to the light source areas that require real radial descent into their darkest value to represent the fact that they are completely looking away from the light source so right here there's a little pocket in between the forehead and the hair this needs to be cleaned up and sharpened so we've got an edge it's a, it's a shadow edge, it's a shadow region edge, so it can't be super sharp, but we still have a little cave here developing. We gotta just clean that up. If that isn't a cave, if that's supposed to be the background, then just make sure you figure that out and make it the background. I think, it, I, think I should consider it as the background. That kind of doesn't make any sense if I do, because the hair is sweeping onto one side. Anyway, next up we have the fact that the hairline is a little bit funny looking. 
So we have to smudge that away. Hair doesn't just randomly start growing. It grows slowly and it just like a, starts getting thicker and we have a detail relief, detail relief uh, pattern here required for the hair texture. And when we want to show off parts of the hair detail, so yeah, I smudged and we lost detail, you just grab the skin color and show where the hair has like points of relief in it where there's no hair growing. And that's just the skin and the scalp coming through. You can tell you use sharpen on this. Just like that. And now you have just moments, just moments of detail. You don't have crazy military like lining of, of the hairs, like they're all aligned militarily, one by one by the other in uniform. So that's all that I see sometimes when I see hair perfectly aligned. And hair plugs are you know those people who have um, a receding hairline that get hair surgery? They, um, you know, that's what it looks like. The doctor is not trying to make it look natural. <laughs> they just make it all grow like on the same line. So if you are getting some of that surgery, then be sure to tell them, hey, can you just like do a zigzag mo motion and put thinner hairs at the front, thicker hairs at the back, and just kind of go back and forth. Please don't put them all beside each other like this. That's my recommendation <laughs> for you if you are getting hair plugs. Or just pluck them out yourself when you're done. Um, so uh, I'm going a little senile here. I'm so tired. So please forgive my weird stories. <clears throat> okay, so this whole section here is in, in shadow, so I'm going to have to adjust what I did. But a couple final little additions here. We've got, uh, what, how am I going to do this? We've got like bone structure. So I'm trying to figure out how this bone structure is climbing into that dome of the forehead, just like that. And then with the hair, again, same thing, over amount, like excessive amount of detail, over representation of the detail. And so I'm doing a detail relief, detail relief. So detail and then relieving it with smudging and just going back and forth till it looks okay and not overwhelming. This much detail cluster is visible in photographs. You, you can't afford photograph level resolution. You're not a printer. So you, you need to find ways to represent the detail without over representing the detail. Indirectly drawing um, the general external look of the texture without drawing every anatomical uh, hiccup or micro texture on the surface. Just this skin is kind of just coming through and it's starting to look like hair. And then we have the symmetry of the face. So one final little adjustment is just the fact that the eyebrows are not aligned. I feel like they're all sitting on a different kind of surface here. The nostrils following the shape of the nose just a little bit off tip of the nose and the size of the far eye but I guess I'll leave that alone and then finally we have the fact that the top half of the eye is in light so it's going to get more light at the top half remember we used to do it at the bottom half and then we're just showing where the light is coming in catching some of that the waterline of the eyeball is light all the way around. It's starting to look like an outline, so we need to darken it all the way internally, just like that. And now we do the full before. So we have more believable light source happening across the face. And I'm just going to continue that. Oops. I'm going to continue that. Um, motherfucker. I'm oh, sorry that bounce light all the way into the chest to complete it. So like the inverse, capture that. And you see how the bounce light is not a pure white? We're not allowed to make it pure white. Any pure white that happens has to be on the, uh, on the light half of the primary, the primary's dominion. All right, so this is not pure white, take a look. Any pure white, I'm just gonna use dodge tool for this, any pure white is supposed to be over here. So the whites of the eyes, the specular highlights, the highlights on the hair, 
which I'm climbing all the way up like that. Um, his neck looks a little broken, so you might want to take care of that. There might be some extra bounce light, not actual ambience, not as a light source, but just bounce light coming in from the bottom like that and diffusing some more. Um, but uh, I wouldn't worry too much about all that. I would do a little bit of ambience just at the top of the hair. Well, I haven't properly lassoed this, but I'm just like that. So we have more three-dimensional a shape. And if you want to darken it again, if you want to darken this whole background again, it'll look fine. Oops. Reason being, uh, the light source that we chose could have been in a bit of a like a dark. It doesn't have to be a universal light source like a sun. It can be a universal light source like an open, um, like like a like I guess uh, outside at sunset in between a bunch of buildings and street lights. All that diffused light source creates like a general glow of light in the area. It can be a, a really strong light in a room in a big large room. Um, it can be many lamps in a room that are of equal size or many pot lights on the ceiling of equal size and magnitude all casting uh, light down. So if you make it a little bit darker, you do have to sharpen these. The darker you go in the background, the sharper these cast shadows have to be because it doesn't explain. Like a moon, moonlight casts sharp shadows um, because it's just a small light source compared to the sun which constantly diffuses its own shadows sometimes. Um, but if you wanted to darken it, go ahead. Lightening it wouldn't be that recommended because it would, again, you need to sharpen that cast shadow because it's like midday now. Whereas here it was like a sunset scene and you have enough darkness to show off that bounce light in the back. So before, confusing light source, you had all this work done into creating the character. The expression looks wonderful, but you had inconsistent shadows all around. And you just need to uh, sort those out. Okay, so that's what I recommend. I'm going to darken it just one last little bit. And uh, there you go. <clears throat> okay, that's a lot of talk. I'm sorry. <laughs> I like to talk about light. Um, so for this piece here, these are just thumbnails that I wanted to take a look at. Um, I love I love some of these. are wonderful. I don't know if you painted the, the one first, then you painted this last, so you just kept going in order. But the last three are pretty much the most beautiful. And it just shows when you're on the canvas, just give it some time. You'll really start to pick up speed. You'll start to make better choices. And, uh, the, you know, the first three are pretty boring. And as the lower you go, the more you seem to have a good idea of how much of the sky to show. So here you started showing less of the sky and more of the canyon. And that's exactly what you want to do in a canyon. You want to make it seem like it's towered over you and hidden the sky away. I know you were talking about canyons here. You started tilting the horizon line, again showing less and less of the sky, but the higher we go, look, lots and lots of that sky showing. So it doesn't really feel like canyon, it just feels like a landscape or a foresty landscape or some kind of travel ahead, whereas here it feels very ominous. Um, and it's a very specific route that you have to go to and it's very dangerous and, and constricted. And, um, and and potentially something big is going to happen in this canyon. And that's how you frame cinematically. That's how you tell stories. Uh, when you're a tiny little ant in a big world, you barely see the sky. If you're covered with uh, large objects, they're so large they hide the sky and shadow you in their, in their I guess, uh, like, you know, cast shadows. Everything is bigger than you, so big you can't even see the sky anymore. Like being small, like, like an insect in a forested scene. But the bigger you are, the more of the sky you get to. Nothing is bigger than you. Um, so if you're at the height of a mountain or something, what I do recommend for characters that are about to meet a, a, a canyon or something is I do recommend a low camera. A low camera and then really, really towering canyons and then you have the opening of the canyon right there. And the camera is really, really low and you see everything in three, um, three point perspective and the character is just this tiny person who has to travel through this and you're showing the route, you're showing where some of these, uh, where there's kind of relief in the road. Um, that's always good if you want to, if you have time for one more thumbnail uh, to try to experiment a low angle with everything pointing up in a three point perspective. Um, so 
that could be an idea. But here you aren't experimenting, experimenting too much with camera height. Never forget to experiment with that. Add that to your vocabulary. Camera height, your design vocabulary. Uh, for this piece, um, it was very, the colors you chose are very uh, like, like a storybook. You're choosing, choose, it looks like Santa Claus, which is really pissed off. Um, and that's because the colors aren't letting me take him seriously. So I'm going to grayscale the background. And then after, actually, no, fuck that. I'm going to grayscale the whole thing, first of all. His face was way too happy and pink to be a pissed off king. He kind of looks like that one guy from um, Beowulf, uh, just like the older version of, is it, was it the older version of Beowulf? The one who was played by, I forget, I forget the story of Beowulf. I, I, I kind of repressed it after university because we studied it. Um, but uh, but yeah, you just don't want to draw, you want to draw him as a pissed off old guy. Clearly he's seen some stuff. Um, so you don't want to give him pink, pink cheeks as if he's a cutie little uh, dwarf um, from Bilbo's company. You want to give him like the feeling that he's hidden something or he's, I don't know, whatever the story is. So I've desaturated him. I'm desaturating the blue shirt that he wears all the way down to a weathered kind of navy or a deep dark. And this matches his attitude a little bit better. And as for that random color you had in the background, um, red just seems like you just chose it just because. Unless he's standing in front of a banner or, or I don't know why you guys choose such saturated environment colors. Because like, unless he, the walls are painted red, who paints their walls red? You, you, you find in stories, you find wall, red walls in like some sort of scary maze or some kind of brothel or something over decorated and pretty. But in a, in a tavern or a cavern, usually things are very, very desaturated. More blue than anything else. If you want to add a color, add a blue to just create a nice little environment. Add like a blue value, just like that. And that'll create a bit more of an environment. Um, and then if you had to, which now you can, actually, let me see if I can do it. Exactly the same thing I did to that Joker fella. I am going to throw the far half of his whole body into some shadow. So I'm going to recede him into some shadow. And then you can, again, bring some secondary light source to diffuse one half. But at this point, you're not really establishing any kind of light source at all. You just seem to be uh, working in this universal, friendly storybook environment. Storybooks don't have many cast shadows on purpose. You want to make it look like the world is just glowing inside out. And that's kind of what makes storybooks really fun to read. But when it comes to painting a, you know, a character that's brooding and moody and all that, just like this fella, you want to just uh, start using all of that to your advantage. But this is something that you could do with this character. Cast him off into some shadows, establish a primary light source, cast some proper shadows, cast shadows that all direct back into the light source, and then, uh, and then cast your secondary light source. It could be a bright, sunny um, window outside, but it's a dark room. It could be a glowy, magical lamp that's blue. It could be anything. Over here, no cast shadow off the, off the eyebrow into the rest of the face which is a problem when you're forgetting to cast these kinds of shadows. Look at his brow structure. It's huge. It's a canopy on top. So again, you're making him look more and more mysterious. And then for the whole skin tone, which is way too pink, I am going to shift it over. Um, I'm going to shift it over into like more cools or yellow, sorry, more warmer values. Again, just give him that jaundice that looks a little bit more believable and less peachy. Less like Santa Claus. Also, the demon of all demons, the, the, the plague of the student's life is <laughs> painting hair with a single pixel width brush to pull off the texture. This is just cheating and it doesn't look good because it looks like you're, I, I don't know, it looks like, it looks like, uh, what does it look like? It looks like, you know how you get corn on the cob? And it has those little hairy pieces at the end. It doesn't even look like hair. It just looks like like wispy things. It doesn't look like hair. Hair cr crumples together. Hair, um, is that the word crumple? 
um, bun the bundles together. Hair has patterns. Hair has flyaway pieces. Hair has uh, uh, you know, I don't know, designs on it, braided designs. Hair has all kinds of stuff on it. And you're cheating your way out of more form by you know, drawing in every single little piece. You need to go in there and show where all these pieces are. So actually just try to sketch them in and show where they where they happen. One thing you can do once you kind of just drop all the mood down of these colors, you can saturate the crown to be a little bit more gold if you want. So that's something you can do. And it doesn't have to be this kind of yellow. This is a terrible yellow. It has to be a cooler yellow, which is more towards the greens. So something a little like that looks great. Even if it's saturated, it's okay. He's supposed to look like a pissed off king. And then we've got that blue in the background. So I'm just going to throw that blue in there and then put it on darken and see what I can do with this. Erasing away at wherever the light source is shining on this crown and then erasing away at wherever the light source is reaching the face. So the sides here we're just building like a really nice environment where we start off cool, it's a dark scene, King is pissed off, but there is a small little torch or some light coming in from the ceiling to reveal all these details, okay? So he looks a little bit less like Santa Claus on a bad day. And then of course you have all that fun stuff to do with the... Uh, let me use this brush with that bounce light. It could literally be any color you want it. It's just going to make everything pop. Remember, we're only throwing this where we do have surface surface areas facing. We're not just outlining everything. We're finding areas where we do have surface areas that are actually exposed to the light source. So part of his mustache, part of his beard, part of the little area here. Of course, all the flyaway pieces back there. Bad. His eyebrow would be catching a lot. Just like this. Okay. So more like a king in his in his own little place and less like pissed off Santa Claus. All right, so this is about controlling mood through values, controlling representing the right character and skin tone. So characterization through skin tone. So you should also be writing this down. Characterization through skin tone environment color and environment mood color mood color um and um yeah just reflecting the narrative of the, the expression with the narrative of the of the uh, mood and then the scene no oversaturated colors if it's supposed to be a dark mood that you're representing anything like that um yeah all right um <clears throat> this direct, can you please do a tutorial on capturing likeness? Um, I am taking questions now. Please write at Istarak to get my attention. I can't see all of that. There's uh, 216 of you. I won't be able to see every one of these unless you write at Istarak. Um, likeness is captured when we uh, measure. So that's the only way to capture likeness. Um, being aware of the beauty standards, so being aware that cute girls have big eyes and small lips and small noses that fit inside the eye line. Um, is a good thing because if you're drawing a cute girl, please for don't forget, don't make her mouth huge just because you're eyeballed it that way. Um, so that'll help. Learning about beauty standards help. Learning about the flip of the beauty standards to create an ogre type character also helps. Um, but it's all about measurement. If you measure right, uh, which means you can trace, I give you the green light to trace. I've said this before, I'll say it forever. Tracing is a learning tool. Uh, so if you're studying to help you develop likeness, tracing over the painting and taking it over to whatever you painted to check yourself or to, to start the painting is fine. If you're tracing, like if you're using the photo, putting it through a filter, painting a couple brush strokes and saying that's your photo, that's bad. That's the worst than tracing. Uh, that's just plagiarism, in my opinion. You haven't even applied yourself. You just pretended like it was your painting. Um, it's pathetic. I'm sorry, I'm really pissed off at that people do that. Um, and then there is uh, the, the, you know, just figuring out your way through the measurements and all the anatomy and, and taking it to the painting you applied yourself to. It's a completely different world. It's not tracing anymore. It's like measuring with a protractor. There's no shame in perfecting your, your measurements and mapping out all that it is. If you get into the level where you're painting pixel for pixel, that's photorealism. Uh, so remember, like, there is a large scope. There's a spectrum of how to capture likeness and... Photorealism is a big no-no. 
using the photograph and photo bashing is, is a no-no. Um, but using tracing and a little bit of measurement picked up off the photograph is an excellent way to teach yourself how to see properly. Now, after doing it for so long and after really drawing on top of the painting and figuring out on top of the photo, and sometimes when I don't have a pencil or paper handy and I'm just looking at people in public, uh, my eye just starts tracing over their face, figuring out how wide the mouth is compared to the nose and how wide the mouth is compared to the eyes and how close set the eyes are. All that helps you determine likeness a little bit better and pull it off. And then now I don't need to even, even need to do it anymore. All I need is the photo near me and I do that all of that number in my, all, the, all those numbers in my head. And sometimes you don't have to capture exact measurement. Tracing is there just to help you capture um, the size of stuff relative to each other. You're not supposed to be measuring millimeter for millimeter. You're definitely not supposed to be trying to capture it exactly. You're supposed to capture the gist of it. Don't sketch over the anatomy of the eyes. Trace a basic circle to represent the eyes. A basic uh, square to represent the nose. Um, basic shapes, that's what I mean by tracing. I don't mean actually tracing every last little detail and transferring it into your painting. Sometimes we can exaggerate the nose just a little bit more and it'll still look like it's, it's likeness. That if, you've seen, if you've seen caricatures, um, they look exactly like the person they're supposed to represent, but even more like them because they've exaggerated all the prominent features. Um, this means like prominent and the opposite of it. So if they had a small nose, they made it even smaller. If they had a big, a big set of eyes, they made them even bigger. If they had one eye that was more lazy than the other, they almost closed the other eye. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, you, it's just about exaggeration. Learning um, if you want to go all the way there and try to capture the, like, the expression and likeness of a, of a character, but you want to add a cartoony touch to it, that's exaggeration. Um, and if you um, remember, all expressions are exaggerated in cartooning as well. Um, also, if you want to trace for beauty or trace for actual applicable characters, um, just use that basic shape stuff relative to nose to the eyes. That's why I say it's good to know the beauty, the beauty rules and what's pretty and what's not pretty so you know when you're looking at it. Can you make a video tutorial on how to draw hair? I must have made like a lot already. I must have covered a lot. Um, what should we consider when choosing background color? Consider the paint of the walls. If it's outside, consider the time of day. Okay, those should be good starting points. Okay, Rosa? A uh, new question, but is there anything that dictates the, dictates the sharpness of the edge other than distance? Um, of course, the focal point. Um, if for some reason you have, I don't know what you mean by sharpness of the edge other than distance. Objects in the distance do have blurrier edges. Objects in the direct foreground also have blurrier edges. What we want to do is bring the focus of the camera or the focus of the painting to the midground where the character is. And most importantly, to the focal point, which is the crosshair in a portrait uh, between the eyes and the nose. That's where all maximum edge work should happen. How stylized are you allowed to go in the 14 day challenge? Uh, the 14 day challenge is supposed to be uh, practicing, perfecting drawing a face. Um, if you want to be permanently uh, predisposed to exaggerated cartoony faces, you can go ahead and stylize. But what you want to do is learn how to draw a realistic face or semi-realistic or, um, you know, just all the basic light sources, light, light sources intact because there's still a lot of form study in a 14-day challenge when drawing a face. So you're perfecting everything that way. When you say stylized, you will give yourself an excuse not to cast shadows properly. So go for realistic. It's just a study and it's just two weeks um, if you do it every day. And it should not be the, the end all and be all of your development and your journey. It's just one section of it that's for sure going to help you improve. Uh, will there be a Purchase Studio Christmas discount? Absolutely. Upon release, there will be a discount. Um, I, I, I will try. I mean, I, I don't think it should. I don't think it's fair for those who have bought it and bought it at the price and then getting the update. And those who hadn't bought it or hadn't uh, supported the, the, the program early on. Um, they, uh, you know, they're getting it for a cheaper price than those who bought it originally. I don't think that's fair. Um, but um, I think the first two or three weeks there will not be a sale. 
Uh, it will increase in price from where it is right now because what we've added is just completely overhaul. We had an overhaul update last year, November. Um, we are doing the exact same thing but on a much larger scale uh, this year. So uh, so I, I think we'll wait a bit before we do a sale, but we will definitely have a sale for Christmas, even around Thanksgiving time. I will just keep up, you know, being more and more active with the sales now that we're nearing the final version of the of the studio and um, the, you know just making sure that we have the capacity to give out sales um, and uh, making sure that it's still going to balance out. Uh, will you do a demo for Portrait Studio when the final version comes out? Yes, there will be a light version. I don't know if it's going to be embedded in the website. I don't know if it's going to be available for download, but there will there will be a light version uh, where you can, can control the camera or control the uh, the light source or something like that. There's there of course not everything is going to be in there. Um, uh, why was it considered bounce light in the first portrait when it was so bright? It was bright, but it was a small light source. It was smaller and less bright than the primary, meaning it wasn't capable of casting shadows all the way around the, the body, was it? No, it could just capture light just to what, was, what it was near to. Um, it was capturing, uh, throwing off light to what, what, what it was near to. Uh, so it's not a massive light source. If you turned off the light of the primary ninja, and you just had the secondary of that last Joker drawing that we had, you would just have those areas. So it would just look like, it would just be a dark scene with these on. That's how weak that light source was. You will have a couple of gradients here and there, but that's why we need a primary because it's either night or day because of the primary. Um, the sun is either set or not. Um, tutorial on metals, I'll keep that in mind. Um, I have not. I have an unrelated question. Will you sell your books in the future? I would be happy to buy it. Yes, I will be um, adding them back into the store once I've reviewed them and feel like they are a representation of my current uh, skill set uh, and writing style. I wrote one of them when I was very young, when I was 23 or 22, um, and I feel like I've learned a lot since then. I'm 27 now. I have a lot more um, experience with students since then. It's just been massive, and I, I truly believe that endurance is experience, and I've had to, uh, just the fact that I went through a year of dealing with students, I have so many more um, examples of when, and, and I kind of perfected my explanation and my diagrams and how I've gone around explaining some of the more complicated uh, topics, and I haven't done any of that, or there's none of that in the books. So I want to make sure that all of that is in there before I re-represent myself with them. And I want to make sure that they um, cover everything as thoroughly as I like. So I'm going to let Abu take the mic now so he can show you guys uh, Portrait Studio and all the updates um, in it. So you guys can see exactly what's going on. And uh, I'm sorry I didn't get to the Star Guardian Annie character. I will get to them le next time, hopefully on Thursday. Hello. Okay, so we're going to start off with a couple of things you guys already saw if you follow us on Facebook. Um, I'm just changing the settings here. So we were talking about adding volumetric lighting and light scatter, um, like in real life, if, if the... Wow, Maybe you want to explain it better. Oh my gosh, like a spotlight where we have some kind of environment where the spotlight is uh, being diffused by some kind of environment or... or atmospheric thickness or something like that which changes the way the light behaves in a in the scene so like here like there's a fog a little bit of fog in that scene I know that's beautiful this this entire setup is just gorgeous and you'll be able to have um, like all of this uh, you know at, at your fingertips whenever you want it controls are very easy UI is very easy um, it's not gonna be in my I know it looks complicated but this is all just really really easy sliders so basically the point of all this is that you don't have to learn how to model yourself in order to get proper references. You don't have to buy clay and make a studio and buy spotlights and you just have all this available to you, this, this, this referencing engine. Yeah, it's, it's all, all in one easy to use. So if you don't want to you know, spend hours learning how to use Blender or whatever, um, the point of this is convenience and having everything in one place mm -hmm. so you can just uh, use it whenever you want. Skip past. However you want. How many more videos do we have to look through? Just one uh, short one. Um, here's that again. I really like this one because it has a lot of um, 
So for this, what's popping in my imagination is like an underground, um, like, uh, kind of like cavern with a character with a nearby light source, and he's kind of just working away at his potions, and it's kind of very, very moody underground scene with very, very minimal lighting. It's always difficult painting a character that has no lighting on them. You don't know what would be revealed to the exact without a perfect reference. Um, I'm also going to add uh, the ability to turn on and off um, like like smoke and particles in the volume itself of light because sometimes... Uh, light doesn't travel in perfect gradients. It has interrupted like mm -hmm. uh, large densities of, of fog coming through that change the way the light behaves. So you can see on the rim of the light source there, we have a lot of uh, like uh, texture building up on the edge. Whereas if we were without reference, we would have just made it a perfect edge, which makes it look very, very unnatural. Mm -hmm. This is so pretty, the multiple light source uh, shadows. So, so you have the ability to use uh, five lights at once. There's a light on the camera. There's a universal light, and then there's three lights, which we're going to call the movable type lights, which you can uh, turn into either a point light, a spotlight, or an emissive object. Uh, particles, will they be able to, are they like lower down in quality for all computers? Oh, the the volumetric lighting doesn't cost anything, really. Oh, okay. So, the, the, one of the goals besides making this look realistic is having it... Um, work well in every system possible so my my goal is at least 30 frames a second um and we're we're kind of over that but when you activate everything at once it does uh tank a little bit so we're, we're trying to get that above 30 because it's not a game you don't need consistent frame rate the whole time you just need it for the photograph of your screenshot to take into your photoshop yeah. for referencing so when we, as we move the reference around, as we, as we move the light source around, there is like a cooking time where it just looks a little funny until the frame stops, and then it maximizes quality. Yeah, so um, I have one more small video, but a few questions. Uh, sorrow heads will still be in here. Yep. Um, Everything that's already in there will already be, um, will be added to the, to the variety of, of uh, references. Uh, models with skin color, we're working on that. We actually have subsurface scattering already, but... Um, it's the thing is with models with skin color, all you need for that is a reference because they're just swatches. Uh, color doesn't change much. Um, it, the model itself has to be colored in certain ways and it's just very complicated and extensive. So what we want to do right now is perfect the light, perfect the models, and perfect the cast shadows. And then maybe afterwards we'll start adding in freckles, we'll start adding in lashes and eye line and uh, all of that stuff. But for now, we just want to perfect it. There will be constantly working on this. We're constantly going to be updating it. So there isn't just one update or one form of Fortress Studio. It's just going to keep getting better. Yeah. Um, what other questions? Um, the Asaro head is actually a custom one. You can download different ones off the internet. But again, um, if you want to use your own software, then you can go ahead and do that. Portrait Studio has everything in it, so you don't have to waste time learning how to 3D model or, or whatever. Um, oh yeah, presets definitely yeah. save like saving slots. Yeah, save slots. We have that. You can preset a certain kind of lighting oh, situation yeah. and load different models in. Okay, so this is the cool thing we did with saves. Now this took a while to do, but we actually got it working already. So um, you can save infinite amount of files now. Before we had five presets. Now it's an infinite amount. You can name them whatever you want. They save to a specific location. And let's say Instabrack does a monthly challenge and you guys have Portrait Studio. Um, let's say there's a lighting scenario she wants you to use for the challenge. She can set that up in Portrait Studio, and save it. She can export uh, the save file because it's a custom file type we made and upload it to her website. So all of you guys can take a project mm -hmm, yeah. can take a project she did and open it in, on your Portrait Studio. Or you can share with each other or do whatever. Where do we download different models? They come preset in there. You don't do anything with Portrait Studio. You don't load other than anything other than your files and your presets, uh, like your your just the save file for different model presets. But you can't load anything in it. It's only what we provide. Um, yeah. So it's not a load your own model engine type uh, because every model comes with different poly counts, and we can't control 
uh, a way to lower the poly count or something like that. That's a completely different kind of engine. All we have is the models that we have and the light source, uh, like the variety of light sources that you have. Yeah. For, yeah. It is possible, but it's it's a lot more uh, complicated. It is definitely possible and, um, to import yeah your own object, but it, it's, again, it's going to take time for us to wrap our heads around that. We, and yeah. When, make when, it available. When we set this up, we 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 mark it for the best performance and the best um, graphical fidelity as possible. So if you just import a model. If your model isn't optimized for Portrait Studio, um, there's going to be issues with the lighting itself. So we just, we have our own library of models. Right now we have probably over 100 models, right? Mm -hmm. And we're going to be adding them slowly. Oh, so this right here is that volumetric lighting with a universal light um, inside of a room with a hole in the top of the roof. So like you have a light shaft coming down. I love this. I just love um, this. And this is all real-time bounce lighting, which Isterbeck talks about a lot. Um, so all that bounce light from the bottom of the, uh, from the from the bottom of the floor, just reflecting up. It's stronger to one side than it would be on the other, which is exactly what we want to see. That only part of the face now is illuminated on the side. Yeah. Which I love. I love dark scenes like this. They're very hard. To, it's very hard to find references like this on Google. Um, and have them in the exact angle that you need. Yeah, yep. so this so is all... Um, this is it. Um, there's a lot more that we can't cover now, so we'll be here for two hours. Uh, but that's the update that's coming up near the end of this month or the first week of next month. So, uh, And your, your porch studios will update on their own. We're going to try to update everything. Um, it's not complicated. I know someone just made a comment that it looks very complicated. As you can see, the UI is very, very user-friendly, very, very basic. It does not have, it just takes a little bit of use. It's way more basic to use than Photoshop. Uh, we don't have all, it's just the, to pull it off is complicated, but that's what the, the programmer Abu has been working on this whole time. Um, uh, this is like the idea started off with something I requested, but from, from then, Abu has taken all the reign on this. and. This is all Abu's work. Don't 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 say it's my 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 uh, software. It's Abu's software. Okay. Um. So, um, right here, I'm showing you guys uh, bounce lighting and how you can turn it on and off. Um, turning it on does cost uh, more resources. Mm -hmm. For your so, computer, basically. Yeah. So you, I'm gonna have settings. You know, low quality, high quality, whatever. But here you can really see the difference between having bounce lighting and not having bounce lighting and how that affects the realism. Yeah, like look at that. There's zero bounce lights. Terrible. And do you see that glow on the edge? Just that glow back? When you turn off bounce lighting, it's gone. Mm -hmm. Because that bloom yeah. is all a result of bounce lighting. And this is uh, adding another light source here. Um, it's kind of just uh, That's a point light. Getting dirty. We, we, we added the, the floor in the room, which I didn't like before, but we definitely need a floor now to get all these cast shadows to work properly. Yeah, and you can turn it on and off, and we you have can turn the floor different off, yeah. types of uh, ground and, and ceiling and everything. I love the yellow light. It's so, like, foggy. It's like a rainy day on the street light. Like, yeah, sort exactly. Of thing. Yeah. Foggy scene. Um, and all those textures on the rock, you know, this head, you don't have to copy the head. You can just copy those rocky textures and just perfect your understanding of just surface texture and micro texture and controlling your own light source for it yeah so um Ooh, look at that it's so pretty <laughs> i love i love the silhouette this this is mainly for studying and using it a lot um the reason you you'll use this a lot is to study and to understand how light and form works um it's not about creating a screenshot and making it look nice it's about learning and understanding yeah, it's the Yeah, applicability. Concept. It's all about learning how to improve through it, which is why that that single like a mission statement is why we worked so hard on it. We could have just not done this. Um, it's a lot of work. No one, ex no, I don't need that extra work. Abu doesn't need the extra work. But this is all for the sake of that getting that reference that's impossible to find on Google. It's for the sake of answering the question, uh, which which is the best reference for this? How do I learn my way around this? Uh, uh, the scene, this exact scene that I have in my head that I can't seem to find a reference for. Oh, that's so pretty. This is very pretty as well for portraits and stuff. 
I remember looking for a reference for a photograph exactly like this. So as you can see, there's no hair, there's no eye pupil, there's no brow, and that's okay because those are all accessories. And this is an excellent tool to use for form, like for 14-day challenges, where you're trying to perfect your uh, form understanding of the face, just perfecting the portrait and what happens along the landscape of the portrait. Yeah, this is all about like Isabel talks about 24/7. Light and form. This isn't about yeah. details. If you want details, all you gotta do is Google makeup and, and eyelashes yeah, and, and all that. Yeah, you'll have a good reference of how to build all that together and add it up in your... But this is one part of your painting. This is one part of planning your painting, generating your, your reference. Yeah. Um, one <clears throat> last thing I want to talk about is uh, we mentioned something called Form Studio a while ago. And... Um, it's a separate little uh, like side for portrait studio, like a mini portrait yeah, studio, we but were, it's just just forms. Yeah, we were gonna do like a like a light version, um, but we're not sure because um, separating everything is gonna be a little difficult. Um, but basically, what we just showed you guys is uh, the portrait version of portrait studio. So you bring in one model at a time. It will also have forms. It will also have shapes. Yeah, but it's one model at a time. Okay. And you you manipulate everything like that. The other version I'm working on, which you can toggle between, um, once you once you have it, is uh, we're calling it form form, form studio. Form studio, yeah. Yeah, or form mode, where you can bring in multiple models at once, um, change their scale, rotate them around. Change their size, yeah. Yeah, and and you can add forms. <laughs> you can add these uh, bodies if you want, um, and just generate like a scene. Let's say uh, you're trying to do like a landscape. And like that dragon mm -hmm. thing, you can always uh, use all the models we have to kind of like frame the scene and get the camera angle you want and get all the lighting exactly. you want. Exactly, especially the camera angle. That's what I love the most about Porsche Studios. When I first pitched it, I said I want control over the camera, the light, and the object. And but that's exactly what you would have if you had a live model. Um, but yeah, this is pretty much it. Thank you everyone for the staying for this extended little preview. But thanks everyone for watching. Uh, have a great day, guys. See you guys next Thursday. Bye. See you guys.